enjoy the event. Great, I think that's my cue to start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, my name is Vicky Ridley. I work for uh, YouthLink Scotland um, in the field of violence prevention using public health methodologies. And more recently, I have been um, instrumental architectural in uh, building Scotland's first positive masculinity programme, Imagine a Man. So more about that later. Uh, <laughs> this year, the festival celebrates its 20th year. Um, we've been having some provoking, inspiring and informing debates um, with people from all ages and from every walk of life, helping them to engage in topical and spirited debate. And I hope today is no different. I look forward to this discussion and hearing from everyone's thoughts and views. It's important that everyone's given the opportunity to contribute, even when there may be differences of opinion and I, I ask you and urge you to treat each other respectfully at all times, which I'm sure you will. We're delighted you can join us today to participate in this discussion on incel culture. And later I'll be inviting you to get involved in some of the questions and comments. If you're keen to throw your thoughts out there, you can do so using the at visit Scott Pal on X twi Twitter or on Instagram at Scott Pal. I should also add that this event is being recorded and will be later available on the Scottish Parliament's YouTube channel. Uh, I'd also like to, if you are triggered by anything in the, the debate or discussion today, um, you should be able to take time out or leave the room for a bit. Um, it's important we'll be covering some, uh, some quite emotional topics uh, within this discussion. So let's get started. I'm very pleased to be joined here today by our panellists, Claire Duffy, Dr Sophie Kinghill and David Russell. So welcome. Dr Claire Duffy is founder and artistic director of Civ Civic Digits, a theatre company, and her latest production, Many Good Men, examines the causes and effects of the incel movement. Dr. Sophie King-Hill is an Associate Professor in the Health Services Management Centre at the University of Birmingham. And David Russell is the Development Lead and Service Manager at Thriving Survivors and previously held the position of Community Safety and Justice Manager at Midlothian Council. So welcome to all our panellists. So pleased you could join us today for what will be a thrilling discussion around insult culture. There'll be, a mem there'll be an opportunity for members of the audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. However, if I may start, uh, I'd like to uh, start to open um, the debate by asking each of our panellists, how would each of you define the term incel culture and how would you describe its impact on young people in today's society? So, Claire, we'll go to you first because you're sitting next to me. Yeah. Um, that's a really hard one. I'm not sure that I can really define it. Um, I can talk maybe a little bit about what it means to me through the work that I've done on Many Good Men with um, making, making a show and working with two groups of young people and exploring what incel culture is with them um, and also the research that I've done online. Um, I started researching incel culture by creating a uh, a sort of safe space for myself on the internet. I created a, an email that was just not attached to me in any way and I typed in how to get a girlfriend and I just kind of like wanted to see what the algorithm did. So I found within sort of, you know, I thought there was sort of maybe 10, 30 minutes, maybe an hour of fairly benign relationship advice which included stuff like have a shower and smile be polite open doors that kind of thing but very quickly it started to become about work harder be strong make money be rich be the boss get the girl and that message then quickly uh, became more violent and more depressed as well and so I started finding myself watching lots of self-recorded interviews with young men mostly young men in cars on their own, talking about how, how desperate they were. Um, so 
I think my sort of definition of in seldom is that it's it's a space that's being created by young men in order to address a very real problem which is a lack of love in their lives and and I think that they're not and what I would you know and I suppose the impact of that is that their solution to that lack of love is blame the blaming of women for it the blaming of all sorts of different causes of it but they focus on women they focus on uh, this also this idea of lookism this ideology of lookism which means that they believe that the world is all structured around good looking people and they don't believe that they are good looking and so therefore the blame is against society against good looking people and against women all women right. and that and that then impacts onto specifically women because they then get to be the brunt of everything from being called bitch to receive you know being raped or you know violently attacked thanks thanks claire for that um would you like to come in david about what incel culture is and yeah. its impact yeah um i think what's important to look at is what it isn't um before we even look at what what it actually is because i think it's it's very much at times misidentified i think at times it falls into other areas so when we look at things such as for example kind of influencers etc for example tape you know these areas get pulled into the conversation a lot but these are very different aspects of the problem and i think that's really important to highlight um i think it's certainly you know when we say about its actual foundations i think what we have to remember is it was founded on vulnerability by a woman um is something that's really important to mention as well in terms of someone going on to seek like you mentioned clear access to to relationships intimacy conversations and dialogue and quite quickly what we've seen from that is is people accessing it which became pulled into that kind of manosphere um area which then is put a bunch of vulnerable individuals often into one space which again we know highlights kind of increased risk of kind of radicalization and also exploitation so those are the the, the themes and i think hopefully we'll unpack them in a lot more detail as, as we go on i hope so sophie would you like to come in um with your views so my views align um with the ones that have already been outlined but the thing for me that is quite often missed within wider society is actually the vulnerability you know these young men and boys are monsterized by the rhetoric uh the social rhetoric that is talked about when we talk about incels so for example um we've got a, me and david got an incel project at the moment and as part of that we're looking at how they are viewed so society either ridicules incels or monsterizes them but actually when we look at the data that we've got they're lost boys they're vulnerable they're emotional there's talk of uh, mental health issues so it's quite sad you know when i do the research that i do so i've done a lot of work with young men and boys i've done work in the fire service i do a lot on harmful sexual behaviors and healthy sexual behaviors it's one of the projects that's made me feel sad you know when i went into it initially i did think oh gosh you know i'm going to read this really extreme misogynistic stuff and feel quite disturbed by it you know and you've always got to look after yourself and your well-being when you're immersing yourself in data such as this what i didn't account for was how sad i felt for these young men and boys and how they felt like society had neglected them but i think that's a theme that i'm was well, definitely a theme that i'm seeing in the work with young men and boys that i've got at the moment that aren't in cells uh with the fire service so male firefighters that we're marginalizing men and by doing that we're making the problem worse because everything that we've done today isn't working it's getting worse you know this is this isn't a problem that's going away this is a problem that's escalating so we need a complete reframing of of the problem and how we tackle it thanks thanks for that all of you um we've mentioned we touched on vulnerability i think that's a really that's obviously a really important point vulnerable people can be exploited um so i'm going to ask david next i think is where does responsibility for incel culture's growth come from where does it come from um how does it start um if you could if you could address some of that individual and more structural kind of causes yeah i mean i think like i said earlier i think it's really nuanced in terms of where it starts and where it comes from but as sophie mentioned this was my area of interest within this what came from supporting the equally safe strategy within a local authority and actually how we embed 
priority four, which was men prevent from violence against women and girls. And I think that was really the perspective I was coming from was a prevention agenda. And seeing really quickly within that, actually, you know, those missed opportunities in terms of capturing vulnerability prior to them leading to harmful behaviour. I think what's important is when we talk about incel historically, we used to always look at incel as violent. That was only the thing that never made the media because let's face it, violent cells. And when we see something in the media, that was what incel was associated with, was those minority of individuals who committed acts of mass violence. But what we wanted to do was kind of drive into actually vulnerability and what is it we need to be doing within that. And that really was when we linked up a lot with, with Sophie and, and her work around the voice of boys. So I think, I don't think you can necessarily take that role of attacking something like incel and intervening with that. I think it's about society's responsibility prior to that stage occurring in the first place. Um, and certainly, you know, my work, a lot, I've done a lot of work within harmful sexual behaviour. And social isolation is a theme that comes up not just within this theme, it comes up across nearly everything we talk about. And it all relates back to mental health in, in some capacity. So I think it is important that we start to look at the health issues and implications prior to just that over-focus on violence, yes. if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Looking at things from a public health approach absolutely. has long been in the, in the yeah. violence prevention sphere. So yeah. any comments from you, Sophie? Yeah, so from my perspective, if we look at the issue of incel, the blame is often on the young men and boys that are involved in this, when actually it's society that has failed young men and boys. If we've created a vacuum where a movement like this can get traction, something has gone on within society. So if you think about it, over the last 50 years, the role of the woman has evolved, hasn't it? We have access to safe abortion, we have access to contraception, we're part of the labour market, we don't need, need a man in the traditional sense as it was 50 years ago. And we've been largely supported in that transition. There's still a long way to go for the rights of women and girls, so I'm not dismissing that. But we can also vocalise when we feel there's been an injustice against us as women. Whereas with young men and boys, and, and also older generations, because it's not just young men that get absorbed and linked into the incel culture, so we've got to be mindful of that. What's happened with them, they haven't been supported in, in the evolution of masculinity over the last 50 years, and that's what's caused this vacuum in which incel culture's got traction, the manosphere, which again, like David said, it's separate from incel, people like Andrew Tate, and again, that's separate again. But if things like this are getting traction, We've got to take a long, hard look at ourselves as a society and have those difficult conversations. Thanks, Sophie. Claire, do you want to come in with a final comment? So what was it that the responsibility yeah. for sort of for, for incel culture? The growth, yeah. the growth of it. it I suppose I see the incel culture as being part of the manosphere and a very extreme end of it. But there's lots of other types of people who are in that manosphere it's a it's a space where men are creating uh you know a sort of safe a safe space to be misogynistic it's what the manosphere is i guess really and it has all these different you know, pickup artists which andrew tate would be kind of for me underneath the pickup artist um and that's kind of glamorous because it fulfills the stereotype of the successful man to be rich to get the girl to be the boss you know and the responsibility but there's also like men going their own way that separatist men or so i think like what sophie was just saying about like why has the manosphere grown so much and then once you're in the manosphere maybe you'll end up in 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 an in, in cell sort of space like why has that grown so much i think it's really interesting what you're saying sophie about that 50 year gap because that's what they talk about all the time they're all saying you know we need to go back to traditional masculinity um no thank you mm -hmm. don't want to go back to backstreet abortions and not being able to vote and not being able to live your life you know that's no good so i think there's been a very much needed um campaign to address patriarchal society in the past 50 years. And those success stories um, haven't included that discussion with men. So what we're not talking about is how are men victimised by patriarchal society. <coughs> I think that's the big missing bit. Yes. And when like somebody like, what's his name, Jordan, 
David Jordan? Peterson. Peter. Peterson. Peterson. Yeah. Yes, him. Like, you know, so it's uh, probably difficult bringing up specific people, but, you know, that they say, oh, patriarchy is good. Traditional masculinity is good. That's what we want to get back to. It's like, no, it only privileges a very small minority of men and the rest of the men who aren't being privileged, privileged by patriarchal society are now that's why they seek out space to be safe to think you know to have that kind of love mm. the reassurance of um, other men and it is mental health driven but it's focused on blaming and hating women and that's yeah. the problem I would love to say more, but as chair, I don't think I'm specifically allowed, <laughs> but I do have a quote, Richard Reeves of Boys and Men, very good book, quite recent. Mm -hmm. I have yeah, he, he, about he, him he, as well, yeah, occasionally. I, I, occasionally too, okay. um, I might digress from him, yeah. but he does talk about feminism has benefited women in ways that hasn't benefited boys. They yes. need a version of feminism that they can actually get behind. And I think that kind of reflects, certainly on the looking at positive masculinity and attempts to look at programmes around masculinity is shifting that narrative from toxic to positive. What is positive masculinity? When we asked as part of Imagine a Man what positive masculinity was, nobody could tell us because they'd only heard of toxic masculinity. I think that's quite telling. Anyway, I'll shut up now and ask another question and this time I think to David because it's about outcomes for boys and young men. <coughs> They're not good at the minute looking at suicide rates, mental health rates, where that intersects with poverty. <laughs> It's even worse, you know. So uh, there's long been, a, a, we call it a kind of crisis of masculinity. I think Richard Reeves calls it a crisis of masculinity, but we might as well as well. Um, with many men not really speaking up, not really confessing to their problems. Um, interesting, those within the incel community are very vocal about feelings and emotions and vulnerabilities and are quite open to ex being exploited there. Um, does this mean part of the model of forum discussions and forums and groups and spaces can be used for good as a space for men to open up and talk to each other about problems. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, just what you mentioned in terms of, you know, incel groups being, you know, talking a lot about, you know, issues and, and struggles and, and, and things that's going on in their life. But I think one of the things that we have to remember is one of the kind of foundational beliefs within incel culture, again, is that mistrust in mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. So that's something that comes up quite a lot. So actually what we see is people kind of self-communicating with each other who are in a very vulnerable, equal position at times. And what we've seen in, in some of that is actually dialogues such as um, self-harm exchange methods, for example, that are being used. So really unhealthy kind of models of, of exchange within in that. Um, I think in terms of, actually, did you ask sort of about intervention as such? And I think it's about packing that space, that yeah. idea of space, isn't it? it? Yeah. Whether it's the internet or in person. I think when we talk about trauma-informed practice, one of the big things we talk about is environment. And this is something, and I don't have an evidence-based answer to this question, this is completely theoretical, but when we talk about trauma-informed practice, we always talk about the environment in which is trauma-informed for someone to be provided an intervention with. What we do know, on the very basic level, is that the incel subcultures feel incredibly open online. They're communicating very well online. They're getting something from that alias, that anonymous anonymity. I think, for me, there is a question that I always think of, actually, is that where the first point has to be? Technology is accelerating um, in such a drastic way. You know, Sophie and I are involved in another project at the moment where is involved in a book, and one chapter's technology that was written a year ago, mm. that chapter is now done because we take so long with three extensions later to do the book, <laughs> we now have to actually rewrite an entire chapter on technology because the technology is completely irrelevant. So I think it just shows us how we have to progress. But I think there is a space. I don't know how you manage that yeah. space because the issue with it is the, the vulnerabilities that come with it. And I think that's when messages become unclear. So for me, there is a continuum almost of incel subculture when we look at the manosphere stuff and what you were mentioning, Claire, about traditional masculinities and things, I see that as something very different to incel. I see incel, like you said, at the top of high vulnerability, high risk in terms of people's own safety and need. Um, in comparison to we see that exchange of how to get money, how to have a Lamborghini, some of the influencers' messaging. So I think there is that way how you police that 
I wish I had the answer, but I don't. <laughs> so, to a lot of exploitation. Sophie, do you want to say anything? Yeah, just to pick up on what David was saying about how technology is shifting really rapidly. I mean, we, thought we can't predict it. Somebody asked me a few weeks ago, where do you think we'll be in five years with technology? I don't even know where we're going to be in six months. I couldn't have predicted AI, uh, deep fakes and things like that. But what we've seen in the project that we're looking at on incels, we're going through Reddit data, but it's dated now because incels are not tending not to use Reddit anymore. They're on TikTok. They're more mainstream uh, on YouTube. So it's more videos with the same kind of toxic message. Um, but that, again, is reaching more young people that feel marginalised, that feel lost, that feel blamed. So many young men and boys listen to this kind of blame culture. And that's not me sitting here as a male apologist. We know that women are overwhelmingly beaten, murdered and raped by men. OK, we know that statistic. But blaming a whole gender is really damaging. We're doing this to ourselves. We are making the issue worse because we're not having those difficult conversations. So when we talk about safe spaces, whether they be online or, you know, face-to-face, uh, -face, you, you don't want young men and boys to stick to a social script. You want the truth, how they really feel. And what I've found in the research that I've done, so with young men and boys aged 13 to 19, male firefighters, uh, looking at the incel work that we've done, there's a pattern, there's a pattern of grievance against women because they're being blamed but are not allowed to be part of the solution. There's also a feeling that's linked to this kind of 50-year issue that I alluded to of um, the worthlessness of the male. You know, they feel worthless, they don't feel anything. And you see that really loud and clear when you look at incel um, positionality. Um, but there's also guilt, male guilt as well. And this is generally uh, white, straight men find that feel guilty and feel that they need to fix, you know. So, so it's, it's a very fraught landscape for men and boys at the moment anyway. We shouldn't be monsterising incels because, like I said, the patterns I've seen in young, young men and boys aged 13 to 19, some from an affluent area, some not so much, they've been excluded from a few schools, they sound the same as the things that are being said on the incel forum that we're looking at. But that doesn't make these lads incels. It means something's gone drastically wrong, but we need to be having these difficult conversations. So, you know, such as you allude to your work on masculinity. Masculinity is now a dirty word, isn't it? You know, there's, there's nothing positive. But when you think about typical masculine traits, they're not inherently bad. Being assertive, being dominant, um, and being powerful, they're not bad things. It's how they're used. So if I give you an example, if my house is on fire, I want someone to turn up from the fire service who is assertive, who's dominant, so will take over the situation, uh, who will give out instructions and who is powerful and put the fire out. doesn't matter what gender they are, but those traits in themselves are not bad traits, but we, we really we damage quite a few young men and boys by having that implication. And as well, one of, one of the things that really that bothers me in the kind of... Sometimes in the violence against women and girls space is that there's this blame culture against men and boys, um, but then they'll go, oh, but my husband's all right, my brother's all right, and Trevor up the road, he's nice, but it's all men and boys, you know? So we've got to be really careful of the words that we're using. You know, we all want this to stop. It's not good for anyone, any gender. You know, we, we've seen this play out. Um, and in terms of even the language we use, so violence against women and girls, I find a, tr a problematic term. From my position and the research that I've done and the experience that I've had, it should be violence against women and children, you know, because we instantly take boys out of the discussion by saying women and girls. There are specific areas where it is women and girls, but we need to, from the get-go, be acknowledging that children, you know, whatever gender they are, need support. But there's also risks of violence against men from men as well. This is a real kind of complex issue. Thanks for that. Interestingly enough, um, for what you're saying about the violence against women and girls is the spark, the catalyst for the Imagine a Man programme came from boys, boy, and, boy and young men's violence to other boys and young men 
that was the statistic because it was 90 percent perpetrators of knife crime because you no know, knives better lives is my project and um, it was 90 percent perpetrators and 85 percent the victims these were the same people you know in repeat victimization patterns so it is interesting we don't want to ignore mm. those kind of statistics either so sophie i'm turning to you again because in may this year at westminster we had a cross-party women and equalities committee which took evidence from academics mm. um, on incel culture they cited poor rates of mental health in neuroatypical men and boys who've been bullied and this seemed to play a role in those young men being recruited to incel culture is that something you can talk to sophie yeah i think first the caveat that i want to say is we have to be really careful when we're talking about young people who are autistic or neuro neurodivergent that we're not saying all people who are autis autistic are potential incels we've got to be really careful of that and i don't you might want to pick up on that with your work with people with autism um but yeah i think when we talk about preying on the vulnerable who's doing it is it is it motivated is it targeted in the main it isn't what we're finding and what we've seen in the research there are key influencers in this incel culture that will try to give false instruction and manipulate but there's not many a lot of these young men and boys um, by accident get into incel or onto incel forums start look looking at incel um, rhetoric and get kind of dragged down this path so there's not like a, a key strategy from incels to recruit it's more they kind of they go down that route because they are vulnerable and because they are lost and because society won't allow them to have a voice to help them to fix the issues that all genders are, are, have got at the moment. It, that, that's really the route we're seeing that they, so, they go down. So, to, so it's vulnerable people meeting other vulnerable people yeah, and gender. they're amplifying their ideas about mm. women, about how they should behave as men about mm. their version of masculinity is that kind of correct yeah and a, sort of a, a forum of vulnerability yeah yeah i would say so in for a lot of young men and boys on there um the interesting thing about incels is that it's the framework it's got a really it's it's got a framework hasn't it they have like their heroes don't they like people like elliot roger they've got their own language their own terminology so it's quite an embedded framework um that we've also got to be aware of as well. It's a lot more organised. Uh, I read a book not long about that talked about it in terms of Drew Parallels with religion. You know, it's got oh, the right, saints right. and it's got the language and the jargon. It's a cult. Um, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Isn't it? It's a cult. Claire, do you want to say more about what you... Because you've just been <laughs> nodding there and I'm like, I'd love to hear more about this. What, about it being a cult? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I don't think I've really got anything to add about that particularly that it's cold i mean i think i think it's all i'm it's saying, some saying, space. saying what it is um i suppose it, it speaks to the need of you know the, the greater need of those individuals why do people why do people sign up for any cult because they, they i mean i keep on saying it because they need to be loved yeah. and they need to have a space where they feel like their life makes sense and has value like we all do and i suppose that the problem for me with um this the incel cult as of as opposed to maybe other cults which i don't know about um is that it's facilitated by um a sexist society by a patriarch yes patriarchal misogynistic society so rather than these ideas being really challenged and really like out there actually they're, they're they're much closer in than we think so yes the the, the very extreme expression of this misogyny by incels is extraordinary and is cultish mm -hmm. and on you know separate if you like from the different areas of the manosphere but like it's really interesting what you're saying about you know men not having a voice and being excluded from society but why can't why can't men self-organize like women did in the 1880s in the 1920s in the 1950s and 1970s why don't grown-up men take responsibility for this and say let's have a chat about this folk, lads we need to we need to address this because my son is not doing so well at the moment yeah you know that's i guess and I guess what we're saying is incel culture is at the apex of this pyramid of supporting hegemonic 
traditional forms of misogyny beneath it. It's not going to be challenged. But I think, I think that's that, really dangerous for society to go, yes. well, what would happen then, for yes. goodness sake? Yes, although I do think there are, that's not to negate some of the efforts of some of the projects. There are amazing and there projects are and there amazing are amazing men, men out there doing yeah. this, but there's not enough. Yeah. Yeah. To that. Sorry. Okay, David. One quick note on that. I think the big issue for me is before we even get into masculinity, what is it? What does it mean to be male? Mm -hmm. And I think the other issues in Scottish culture, particularly, if you look at some of the campaigns that have been done historically, one in particular, where it is a campaign on on TV, it's a bunch of conventionally attractive, quite obviously okay. heterosexual men mm -hmm. in a bar drinking pints of beer, watching football. That doesn't talk to my sense of being a man. I'm quite comfortably male, but that isn't me as a male. Mine's with being Harvey Nicks with a martini. <laughs> so I think you have to highlight those themes that actually I class myself as a safe male who's got a lot of women, family members, girls, you know, mums, aunties, strong women in my life that I would drop dead for, you know, tomorrow. But that doesn't speak to me. And I think a lot of the boys I work with, it doesn't speak to them. Mm. Autism, for example, where they're socially isolated, so they don't, they can't connect to that environment that we are telling society that's what it is to be male. Football, I despise it personally myself. It doesn't talk to me, and it doesn't talk to a lot of young boys. So I think before we get into the, come on guys, let's talk, we need to understand what does it mean to be a guy to talk, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. And doesn't appeal to lots of young men, yes, yeah. agreed. There's lots of young men who don't, identify with football, but there's a hell of a lot of young men who do identify yeah. with football. Um, and that's why many good men situated itself inside a football ground. We made that show yeah. at Hearts Football Ground. And the reason we did that was because we did that some research with some young men and asked them exactly that. What do you think it means to be a man? Yeah. And really explored the positive aspects of being a man. And it, for them, it 100% came from football. Yeah. Leadership, teamwork, friendship, looking after each other, taking responsibility. These were the things that young men were telling us it meant to be a man, and they saw that in their football heroes. Yeah. That same, same for us when, uh, when we first researched Imagine a Man, that was the first question we asked. So we got a really big response from our survey, which told us something, that there was a real desire to talk about masculinity. It was a gap. There was boys and young men and young women wanting to talk about that. What is it like to be a Scottish boy, yeah. a young man in, in 2021, as it was then? Um, and they mentioned all of those things, football, they mentioned confidence, but the other thing they mentioned was humour. Uh -huh. yeah, the yeah. bants. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they talked about the bants and yeah. bantering, getting along with mates and having a good time. And that seems to be part of the scaffolding for boys and young mm. men, I think, is having those relationships and keeping humour. Well, you uh, can see that in incel yeah. culture because it's very yeah. funny. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's not in, not in a good way, but it's, it, it is witty. It's got, you know, it's, it's tropes. It's com comedic it, tropes. It's negative tropes. Yeah. But on the other side, when we were doing the kind of youth work, the, the countermeasure, if you like, to kind of look at talking about the role of young men in relationships and relationships to each other and, and to women, that humour came in really handy. We could kind of subvert it almost to create better hum relationships. Humour is dangerous online as well, though, because people get away with think they get away with a lot by, and I guess this is what I'm including in the incel yeah. things, like, well it's just a joke and it's not no, absolutely, you do need some sort of mechanism for being able to challenge yeah. there in, that, in terms of youth worker, that was a, a pro-social adult, possibly a role model though we know less about how that impacts um, I'm going to ask uh, Sophie another quick question about how much of the fear of in cells is about moral panics mm. and folk devils. Folk devils, yeah. The monsterisation that I talked about earlier. We've got to be really careful of that, of demonising these people online. Not every single person who's on an incel forum or being part of this culture or discussion is going to go and murder women. We've got to be very, very clear about that. There are risks, very serious risks, of being within this subculture. However, it's the monsterisation of these young men and boys that is it's fueling the fire you know this is not helpful to to see them as monsters they're people you know and they're vulnerable and when you read through like i said i felt sad instead of angry or um disturbed and there are, there is disturbing content on there and it is really extreme misogyny which is driving it but other than that around that there's vulnerabilities um and like i said you know it's it's 
quite easy, especially within the media. I know you mentioned earlier, didn't you? you know, the media will run with th something like this, this monsterisation, this fear, you know, this scared of incels. Well, we shouldn't be. We should be supporting young men and boys so they don't go down that route. And those that have gone down that route need the support to come out. Thanks, Sophie. Love. Love, love Claire. Yes. yes, you've mentioned the need to be loved. David, you talked about kind of vulnerability and this being open to exploitation. Can we look at what kind of interventions, if any, have been effective in addressing boys and young men who take may be at risk of taking part in more incel culture? Um, and, and how can we help them to step away from it? Um, and for example, what should the we're in the parliament here what should the policymakers be doing you know what is it that they should be legislating for for our schools for youth work for our interventions what are they doing about it what should they be doing about it so claire um i think th th one great thing is that there, there is the violence against women and girls there's i can't it, i don't really understand how politics works exactly but there are policies about this in scotland and there are people's jobs it is to to address this and like, i'm going to talk next week to a group of a whole, a whole mixture of different people so there's 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 work that's being done to link up across the whole of scotland so every two months this group come together and there's teachers and there's youth workers and there's policy makers and so there's there's a broad range of different people who are specifically looking at this and trying to do stuff about it. So there is stuff being done and that's really great. And it's good to note that that's something that the new Labour government wants to do something about. So that's really great. Um, there's amazing youth workers out there doing amazing stuff. Um, I guess from my point of view, I feel like from my experience, talking directly to this issue isn't necessarily the best way in. And I think particularly if you were to, if you want to address something, if you want to address content online directly, it can often, it, it feels like a challenge. It feels like a blame. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's a guilt trip and, and it's a alienating. So my route in is through art and creativity yeah. and to use the power of storytelling. So with Many Good Men, for example, the, the, the offer to participants, and this was really a test out, so this was kind of like to, to see how it would work so that we could now hopefully go out and work with actually vulnerable young people who are you know, closer to this material. Um, but the, but what I think what works is when you offer um, young people, you go, look, what's the worst case scenario? What if there was a shooting in Edinburgh that was caused by incels? and somebody was there and witnessed it and they didn't know anything about incels and so they went and started looking at their stuff and they became radicalized by it how can you go from kind of nowhere in your relationship to the manosphere and incel identity how can you go from nowhere to actually being really close to doing something violent for misogynistic reasons what is that journey imagine that what would it take and so you tell a story, you create a character, you create a world around them. And through that, you get to explore it, but you don't, you're not invested in it. It's not you. Yeah. It's not, yeah. you know, you're putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else who's going down the extreme version. And then you can, and then in Many Good Men, what we did was gave the audience the opportunity to say, well, what if, so that's the, that's the, that's the downward spiral version of the story. But what if you could go back to the beginning of the story and make an intervention? Yeah create a different character who could step in and be an older sister, be an older brother, be a dad who listens more. Yes, it was maybe. very good, I saw it. Maybe be yeah. a coach, a male coach or a male teacher yeah. who isn't scared of talking about what masculinity is yeah. and doesn't model a kind of masculinity that makes you feel bad. You know, yeah. and, and what I was particularly proud of with the Many Good Men project was that it created that intergenerational space so that grown up men could be actually trying out in character through imagination and creativity yeah. what it might feel like to challenge another grown-up man and say, I think your approach isn't working, mate. Let's, could we work together to try and change this? Yeah, it was very interactive. I went to see it. I thought it was really excellent. I think some of these things are beginning to kind of tackle um, the topic. I think it was like really powerful that people had the choice as to what happened next. I think it's called Forum Theatre, Augustus Paul. Yeah, yes, yes, yes I knew that. Brazil. Comes from Brazil. All the good stuff comes from Brazil. <laughs> um, <laughs> interventions, David, would yeah. you like to comment? 
Um, yeah, first of all, I don't think it should just sit with violence against women and girls. I think that's the one place that we're going really wrong, and it's where we've went wrong for years and years, within the harmful sexual behaviour work, within sexual offence focus work. The issue that we're missing is we are not seeing the important message of health and public health. If we don't look at the underlying health issues that potentially lead people's journey to this, then we're, we're completely missing the intervention point. I think it's unfair to put that on committees purely around violence against women and girls. I think health have to stand up and be accountable as well and be part of that conversation. Um, I think there's a lot of work there to be done. The other thing I would say, and I can say this now because I no longer work for a local authority, free reign, that red tape's gone. Um, Do I they... issue a trigger warning? <laughs> trigger warning. Anyway. Um, no, it's not that bad. I think the issue is, is we get told as local authorities we have to do things. We have to have white ribbon campaigns in place. We have to be chartered for LGBTQI. We have to do all these things. But what we should remember is, instead of doing all of them, let's do one really well. So actually, when we invest in something like Equally Safe, which the theory behind is fantastic, let's actually do it properly, let's invest in it, let's not just do it as a charter, tick the box, move on to the next charter. What does that actually mean? And really lastly, I think what that highlights is using, and to plagiarise next door, I think Sophie's, one of the, the projects that I find most fascinating that Social University of Birmingham done was around period poverty, where there was an assumption that girls would want to be in sex education alone. But actually, when they spoke to the girls and spoke to their voice and asked for their voice, they said, we don't want that. We want boys in that class so they understand what we are going through. So policymakers have to have those voices around the table. And again, not making it tokenistic, they should be around the table and be at the final piece of that policy coming into action. Sophie, do you want to say anything about interventions? You know, have you seen any on your academic travels that yeah. have impressed you? I've seen quite, quite a lot. I think when you work in social justice and you research these areas, things can feel pretty hopeless sometimes. You know, quite often I just think, oh, why do I do this job? You know, why do I do this? When sometimes it can feel really hopeless. The young men and boys space is, I'm hopeful. And I don't say that very often, you know, pessimist, middle-aged woman. I'm hopeful. I've seen a lot of changes in the last four years, and I don't know if the other panellists will agree. There's, yeah. there's some really good pockets of work going on that are having these really valuable, realistic, honest conversations about what's needed to stop young men and boys going down this route. And the, the ground is shifting, you know, the, the conversations are different. Um, and there are some really good interventions, and you've alluded to, to some, you know, local to me, we've got um, people going out to schools to work with young men and boys specifically. Um, and I run a masculinity conference, and there's another one coming up in the Midlands, not, not one of mine. Um, lots of different speakers talking about this issue. So I think we're bringing it into the public consciousness but we're also starting to have these different conversations. You know, what can we do to support young men and boys? Not, aren't they terrible, horrible people? You know, uh, there's a shift. There's a definite shift that I can feel. And I'd, like I said, I don't say that very often. We've shifted the narrative in Scotland from toxic to talking about positive masculinity. It needed reframing. And I think we've gone some way in doing that. So there are some good projects around, like Imagine a Man, Many Good Men, Men Minds, Mending Mindsets, Men's Sheds Movement. So there's an awful lot now um, of things happening in that space to support uh, boys and young men. But I'm going to give a shout out to community-based youth workers, because that is my background. And I would say that those role models, we need to find out more and have more of those role models impacting as they do and in, in what ways. Um, it takes just one pro-social adult to have that difference. So I'm going to kind of wind us up there and I'm going to ask if other people have some questions. Bit of a Q&A session here. There was some instructions I was given about how this should run <laughs> and roving mics and things like that. So festival assistants will be on hand with roving mics to assist if needed. Uh, if you could raise your hand if you want to ask a question, um, indicate who you're, who you're selecting your question to on the panel, that would be really helpful. And if you could keep your hand raised until the mic reaches you, we've got roving mics here. <laughs> One, <laughs> I hope you're fast. Um, and I'd now like to invite you to participate in the discussion. So please raise your hand if you have a question. 
Okay, your hand was up first. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Linda Thompson from the Women's Support Project. I'm a national coordinator. Thank you so much to the panelists for your input. It's been really fascinating. I suppose one of the questions I would like to pose is that, Claire, you talked at the start about that kind of aspiration that's placed in front of young men in terms of have the car, have the lifestyle, have the clothes. But what I've seen very often is that's on the uh, young men are encouraged to achieve that on the backs of women's bodies. If we think of some of the phenomenon around e pimps, you know, men moving into the space of OnlyFans, taking over women's content. Andrew Tate, I hate to use his word, a name and kind of highlight him, but as we know, he has charges around human trafficking and putting women in OnlyFans. So I'm really interested about the how, in a way, the, the role models, how they achieve some of that success is on the back of women's bodies. So how do we kind of engage and engage with young men around that concept that there's other ways and women's bodies are not to be consumed nor to be profited from. Thanks, Linda. So who would you like to answer that? Or would anybody like to volunteer to answer that question? I'll just open it up to any of yeah. who might like to come in. I think if we're talking about Tate, we've got to remember he preys on vulnerable men as well. You know, he makes money off vulnerable men. And so that's a type of toxicity. It's very different though to incel. Um, but it's about opening the dialogue, having the honest conversations, having safe spaces with young men and boys. So on one of the projects that uh, I had with young men and boys, the research project, uh, we asked young men, um, so they'd been ex excluded for a number of, from a number of different schools, these lads. They were hilarious. The university didn't know what to hit them. And uh, it was great. And um, we said, what would you ask if you could be anonymous? And the one lad, 15, been excluded from about three schools, remember? He just said, look, and it was a simple question, like, is one I'd one, two or four? He said, you know when a girl wears hardly any clothes? I said, yeah. Do I touch her or not? That was it. And it took me about 30 seconds to answer. But that had sat with him, and he'd never had a forum to ask that question. So you can see what's going through his head. He's thinking, well, all my friends will encourage me to touch her because I need to fit in the hierarchy of masculinity. Is it an invitation? Is it not an invitation? Does it mean that I'm rejecting her? Another thing we need to talk about, which we really, we neglect, there isn't, this isn't in a public discourse anywhere. When we talk about consent, it's always about women and girls. What about when men and boys don't want to do anything sexual? And the young men and boys on the project talked about consent, and what they said they'd do is they'd manoeuvre the young woman into a position where she would say no. So they'd say things like, are you sure you don't have to? Because they felt they couldn't say no, because first of all, she'd feel rejected. Uh, and second of all, because they're a man and a boy, and that's what's expected of them. So I think we need a, a real big shift in the conversations that we're having. Um, and some of them are really uncomfortable. Can I just add to that? Yes, I think course, as well, the, the, for me, sex education comes massively into this. And I think yeah. we, and every, if anyone's ever seen me speak before, this is like a broken record. But the thing for me is that we're completely failing on the delivery of sex education. Mm -hmm. Scotland has some of the best resources available to us in terms of RSHP, some really deep topics around pornography, again, some of the messages that you're describing there. But the problem is, is it's inconsistently delivered, dependent on education establishments, because we don't invest in teachers' training to deliver these really complex discussions. So when I think of some of the interventions I've provided, I've taken them to significant training to have those conversations, and I feel comfortable talking about these things. To ask someone just one day to go in and talk to a bunch of students about porn, when you've actually just been delivering history two sessions before, mm. it's really a lot to ask, and I think... We, for me, we need, to, you know, years ago we used to say it should be just as important as maths or English. Well, I think it should be more important than maths or English because ultimately that's, that's where it starts. And I think, you know, thankful for the, the change in government in terms of some of the bills that we're about to go through in terms of blocking sex education prior, you know, to primary school age. Nobody says primary school kids should be taught sex in terms of its, of its mean. But what we have to know is that they're going to be exposed. Some of the research tells us they'll see porn by the time they're 12. Nine. So, nine. So, we want to be able to combat that message a lot faster before we actually get into the, the, the issues that we're having. So, I think that does filter into some of that as well. It was something that came up a lot with the work that we did in developing the stories to make many good men, talking about sex education and how 
almost pornography is one kind of sex education and it's sort of doing a job because there's such a lack of substantial sex education in young people's lives and what's particularly lacking in that sex education is talking about emotions talking about what love is how do you love somebody how do you respect somebody how do you feel how do you talk about how you feel how do you feel know that you feel safe how can you kind of trust yourself in those moments rather than being influenced by what's expected of you mm -hmm. whether you're a man or a woman or a girl or a boy yeah. and that's or something in between and that's where porn has kind of really kind and of porn yeah built absolutely up. becomes it becomes a sex education by default yeah and i think yeah. sorry so, no, you, we've so, got to be really careful of demonizing porn as well so i'm not advocating pornography first we've got to know and it's not going away Kids are going to see pornography, whether it's unintentional or intentional, and there has to be a space to open the conversation. So I've done talks before, and I open, and I'm like, I say, put your hands up if you've ever enjoyed watching pornography, and the whole room goes, <gasps> and I'm like, not really, nobody has to answer that. But we have to get to a space where we know it's being consumed. I've also had discussions with young people who said they wanted to perform oral sex on their girlfriend, and they wanted to see how to do it. I've also had conversations with young people that said, I felt really insecure about my body and what genitals look like because there's no sex ed. And it reassured them. So that I'm not advocating for pornography. I'm saying we've got to be very careful of the conversations we have around it because we need young people to be able to come to us and say, in a safe space, I saw something on a mainstream pornography site and it really bothered me. Can I talk about it? We're not at that position yet. Um, and then you've got, there's quite a few grassroots groups that think that they're going to take on a multi-million pound industry and shut it down. It's not going to happen. It's unrealistic. You know, it's, it's too late. It's not going away. It's going to escalate. And we've got to manage it very rapidly, but realistically. Can I go back to Claire? She wants to come in. Yeah, I was just going to, I just wanted to come in and say that I agree with you. There's no point in demonising porn. But I do feel like I want to demonise the porn industry because the way that they target people and exploit them. So if you watch something that's mainstream and not violent towards women and not, you know, the, I don't know, whatever <laughs> words to use, but very quickly, just by looking at it, and it's how the whole internet works. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you go to Instagram and look up how to bake a cake, you'll be quickly sent, sent messages about how to get thinner, which will quickly send you to more images about how to starve yourself. Right. You know, that this is what the internet does, and it does it with porn to such an extreme extent, and it's becoming normalised. And, and I completely agree with you. If we can't talk about that with young people, like, we already... Like, we, we know that there are... You know, there's, you know, there's lots of young people who are having serious sexual issues... Mm -hmm because of their porn addiction. It's tragic. Mm. Linda, do you want to come back? No, nope, that's grand. That's grand. OK, have we got another question uh, over there? I think this next, and we'll come to you next on this side. Thanks. Something I'm not sure has been mentioned today, but I've heard elsewhere, is like a sense of entitlement. So, so the boy says, I am entitled to either love or sex or, or, or something, and I'm not getting that. And I'm not quite sure where the sense of entitlement comes from. Do we all think that? I haven't quite got my head around that yet. Just because we have it, did we expect to have it and did we think we were entitled to it? That relates very interestingly. I read an article this morning from um, an academic in Australia that talks about dealing as a teacher, challenging boys and young men's sense of entitlement and that being very difficult. For them and very challenging i think claire you wanted to come in yeah i just want i suppose my initial reaction is i think we are entitled to love i think everybody's entitled to love not all entitled to sex and where our sense of entitlement comes from i think where a masculinist you know a male supremacist understanding of their right to have sex comes from male power male centric power structures I think that's where it's really important that we don't get mixed up with incel and what's in Manus there. So based on the initial kind of scoping exercise that this study's done, what I would argue is that very few that we've pulled that data on have suggested they feel 
worthy enough to be entitled to have sex. Mm. And there's a big difference there in terms of those groups. So I think people that are following some of those influencer groups, etc., and in that manosphere or kind of red pill traditional masculinity beliefs, absolutely. But I think in some of those incel groups, the area that we've been really focused on is the vulnerability. And that's important, you know, to think about is actually a lot of those people look at those traditional masculinity roots as something completely superior to themselves. So that low self-worth to the point they don't even believe mm. they, they belong to that theme. Um, and again, there's so much research still to be done, I think, around the connection between sex and incel in, in that way. And so actually what they most need and are entitled to is self-love. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Does that answer your question? It makes good sense, thank you. It makes sense of it. Good, good. OK, there was a, uh, somebody on this side had their hand up. Um, sorry, can you hear this? Cool. Yeah. Um, I suppose this isn't a question and more just some thoughts. I think earlier on in the conversation, feminism was unfairly blamed. Uh, feminism isn't aiming for female superiority, it's aiming for equality. I know that's a very simplified and watered down definition, but it's what it always comes back to. Feminism also wants to deconstruct toxic masculinity. It wants men to be happy and comfortable within themselves so that they don't take that repressed anger out on women. In terms of the discussion of blaming men for women's violence, men feeling blamed by real facts and statistics is not a feminist problem. Exposing real facts should not be seen as targeting men. There's an issue in men seeing statistics about violence towards women and making it about themselves. Um, me and my friend Paola here were also talking about how although vulnerability can exacerbate problems, um, the main issue is incels being misogynistic and seeing women as objects. Sorry, I was reading notes from my phone. No, that's, 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 that's quite robotic. Time, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that chimes a lot with... Um, with imagine a man looking at kind of what would a feminist, what would feminism look like for boys and young men? And that's where we came up with the title positive masculinity or healthy masculinities as well. So thanks for your, your observations there. That was great. Anyone want to kind of comment from the panel? I think just say as well. It's, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think the work that I've always been acutely aware has been male in this space. We have a real passion for the prevention of violence against women and girls, I think it's been so important. But what it's highlighted to me is, particularly within Equally Safe, is there's a role for many people around that agenda. And I think, you know, any field that I've watched, I've worked in the child sexual abuse field for years and I'm incredibly passionate about advocating for victims and survivors. But I think one of the things is we have to be able to look at that perspective from a prevention perspective, to look at the roots of disruption. So absolutely agree. And I think that is the, the, the whole ethos. And I really do believe in the equally safe strategy for that reason. If it's done how it's supposed to be done, there's routes and avenues for different perspectives to come to that conclusion. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. And I would also add that I think work, any work on masculinities needs to be seen through a feminist lens because it's the sort of thing that could get hijacked. Well, and, and, is. and it is by yeah. the right and positive masculinity could be described as one thing that's that's not what we actually anticipated. So definitely um, right to, to look at all that work through a feminist lens um, towards a gender equal society. Uh, any further questions? Clyde Uni. <laughs> CYCJ? CYCJ? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm, my name's Hannah. Uh, I obviously go to the University of Strathclyde. I'm doing my dissertation on men and boys and uh, how the feminist movement has like impacted the our striving for equality on the men's part. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, do you think the intense focus on incel culture and toxic masculinity might be overshadowing legitimate issues faced by men and boys, including mental health, uh, their lack of educational attainment, particularly in young education and uh, labour labor market in inequalities? Uh, and how can we ensure these issues are addressed without being conflated with the more extreme aspects of the manosphere and are causing issues to be trivialised? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to the <laughs> I'll go to our panel. <laughs> yeah, so you know, to echo, yes. Um we need to do more. We need to do more 
for the benefit of all genders, you know, and I, I think, you know, and alluding to, to the comment that was just made as well, I agree with what you're saying, but we have to take a realistic position on this. You know, I do, I've got some work that sits on the periphery of the work that I do with construction companies, and two men a day die by suicide in construction because of all of these issues that we talked about. But in terms of you talking about it being a distraction, it is, it's because it's sensationalised, isn't it? Because they're demonised and, you know, it makes a good news story when actually we should be looking at these kind of sensible options through relationships, as Zach said, through more support for young men and boys, alongside support for other genders. This isn't to neglect the um, support needed for women and girls. This is alongside support needed for all genders, you know, so that it's, it's not, you know, we're not binning off all of that work with women. It's, we, we need to do it together. Does that answer your question? Yeah, um, yeah. can I do a quick follow-up question? Of course you can. Right. Of course you can. Um, with, like, your expertise in, in this area, how would you say to, uh, like, my dissertation, I'm a journalism student, so I'm going to be working in media and that, kind of industry how would you discuss with like media conglomerates and journalists to change the narrative and make it a more positive mm. uh, conversation and try and avoid sensationalizing because it's quite a difficult thing in media because that's what brings the that's what runs the business that's that's how you make the money that's how you get the news out there could i maybe come in as a as a sort of knife crime kind of from that perspective, with, with using a public health approach and kind of violence prevention, we were very aware that one of the reasons young people tell us they carry a knife is because they're, they're afraid. So simply showing all these images of big of knives and yeah, it's always teenagers and hoods and with a, with a knife, they kind of go to these stock images. But showing these images is really popular for the for the press so it took us a long time but we've, we've started to turn some of that discussion through educating them uh, we produced our own stock images that didn't show knives and didn't show blood and didn't show kind of people being stabbed or in the, uh, or in violent pursuits uh, and it has slowly the discussions got a little bit better and i think we're at that turning point for talking to the press about masculinity as well and trying to reframe that narrative around toxic masculinity because they do use that phrase a hell of a lot in the kind of press in the media and i think there's a kind of body of work that can be done similar to the knives that we educate them and we provide them with tools that they can use that are free um, so yeah i don't know if anyone else wants to add anything i saw something about like yes the, how 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 these how, how this subject is framed and being able to talk about things like love and emotions that are kind of grounded rather than, yeah, creating catchphrases like toxic masculinity. Um, it's, it's harder, but it's more valuable. Do you, do you know when toxic masculinity came into common parlance, common usage was um, 2015? So it doesn't seem that long ago. You know, it's really kind of caught on. So I think we just have a body of work to make sure that something else catches on. Um, as well. So that was a really interesting, good look at these studies. CYCJ is the Community Youth Justice Scotland, is based at Strathclyde University. They have um, a Men Minds project that it would be really good yes. to chat to, to them. Good. Uh, okay. Man just next door. Oh, so pass the mic there. across. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, so I had a, a question um, kind of to a point that David raised earlier around this idea that there are different spaces in which young men exist that do not necessarily overlap. Um, I do some work with young men who predominantly play computer games and exist in a space that's very separate and would not even step foot in, a, in a, an event that was taking place in a football stadium because they could not imagine a place that's less relevant to their interests. And I guess my question is, is like, as people who are working in that space and, or as researching in that space, how do you keep track of the actual spaces that young men are in in reality? And how do you equip yourself with the skills and the knowledge to be able to actually engage with people in those spaces where they may not overlap with things that maybe that people who do this research know about or have insights into? I 
don't think it's okay. actually even about research. I think it's about person-centred interventions, isn't it, in terms of what, what is... When we first start I'm thinking, a lot of the work I've done is around kind of harmful sexual behaviour with children and young people with autism. And one of the things that we've seen really quickly is to that in route, and you'll be aware as well in practice, the in route is what is your interest? What is it you really, really like? And I've had entire interventions. You know, I know nothing about Star Wars, but I feel like after a 12-week intervention with a young person, I learn everything about Star Wars. <laughs> so generating their interest is really, really critical, I think. And it might be that that interest is part of the issue, but that, again, is an opportunity to start to look at things. So if their issue, for example, is, say, they're intensely interested and they've been referred to an agency for excessive use of pornography, for example, or addiction to pornography, then actually look at the interests that lie out with that. But you have to address the issue, because that isn't going away. But we need to take that on. So that example of Star Wars that I've just given was one of those cases where we had to use characters from Star Wars to describe what people do in Star Wars is not what they do when they go home in Hollywood at night. Yeah, And it's something as basic as that that can open up dialogue and conversation. But again, that really comes from that kind of child-centred or person-centred intervention model, where you're really finding someone's interest and trying to work or build an intervention around that. Um, and I think, you know, those are the bits for me that are important. I think that theme for me always... I've, I've asked myself that question for a long, long time. I've worked in the prison service, I've worked at Bernardo's in, in children's services, I've worked across a, a range of different fields. And one of the things that always comes back to me in the context of violence in men, in terms of men perpetrating violence, is what does it mean to be male? And I think that's still a question that is unanswered, you know? Yeah, and I think it's okay that it's unanswered. Like, yeah. I think, you know, a big question, like, what does it mean to be male? What does it mean to be female? What is gender? What is love, even? Like, these are big questions that humanity doesn't get to get an answer for. That's fine, as long as we're engaged and interested in it. And to answer your question, which I think is a lovely question, um, I think my answer is... If, if you're working with a group of young people, you want to address something where you know that they're doing stuff, they're, they're, they're in a place where you can't get access to. Again, I'm <laughs> going a bit of a broken record myself now. It comes back down to this question of love, doesn't it? You have to, you have to be able to give a young person that's enough trust that they tr to build a relationship with them so that they have trust in you, that you're not going to disappear, that you're there for the long term, that you are interested in them and care about how things are going to turn out for them. And if you can build that trust with a group of young people or, a young, or your own child, then they will trust you enough to tell you about the places that they go to and what they experience there. That's a beautiful description of a, a pro-social adult, whether it's a parent or a youth worker. So thank you for that. Does, does that answer your question? It's not really about policing the spaces. It's about engaging with young people so that they share their knowledge of those spaces with you? Yeah, I, I think so. I think I have, in my experience, found that if there's like a common language that yeah. the adult can share with the young person, that makes those forming those bonds a bit easier. And yeah. thinking about like game spaces in particular yeah. and like the language that yeah. you, people use online that's separate from yeah. like other so, spaces. So what, all I'm saying is that when I've encountered that, I felt scared that I'll be rejected because I don't know the in language. And what I found is if I reach out to them and say, well, I don't know about that, but I'm here. And we can, we can do this thing together that we can both do. And eventually that young person will start talking about that if it's important. And then I'll get to learn the all right language. All sorts of things you didn't know before. Yeah. Yes. And all sorts of phrases. And someone add, at the back. Off the, off the back of that <laughs> question as well, you know, um, first of all, ask them. But when you ask them, you've got to be aware that you need to listen. And it can't be tokenistic. You know, you can't ask them, they say one thing, you think, oh, well, I'll just do what I wanted to do anyway. You've got to be willing to change and really respect their agency. Um, in the direction they want to go in with things and the support they need. So that, that's what I would say from my experience. You've got to be willing to shift. Yeah. Yeah. I think respectful, reflective conversations are probably key to a lot of things um, and a lot of kind of progress made. And, and I keep looking at you and thinking about love, but you talk about love <laughs> yeah. and I think that's so important. And it's that secure, loving relationship that kind of sits underneath that. So. There was a hand at the back there. Oh, 
couple of hands. There's a couple of hands. Right, let's let's run to the back. Oh, um, sorry. oh, sorry, we'll come back to you on this side. I've been looking at the panel too much mm -hmm. here. So. Hi, um, Hi, my name's Ethan. I'm from Passion for Fusion. And I just wanted to say that as a young man in Scotland, that I had no idea of insult culture and the dangers of it until the Many Good Men project. Uh, until the Many Good Men project. And I would just like to ask you guys, how can this awareness be systematically included into our education system? Okay, thank you. Go for it, Claire. Oh, well, <laughs> I don't know about how to systematically do it. If somebody will pay me to do it, <laughs> then I'm there. <laughs> There's, uh, we're, since we did The Many Good Men, when we were front page of the, inter uh, of the BBC news for the whole day until somebody who killed a woman 20 years ago knocked us off the top. So I was kind of like, there's a picture, there if you like, of, of the issue. So we got so much, so much interest. We've had so much communication from youth workers and teachers and all sorts of people who want it. There's a clear need for it, like having an arts-based approach where it, you're creating that safety through arts and creativity to talk about these issues. I think really works and there's obviously a clear need for it but it's got to be paid for by somebody and that's really challenging but yeah. thank you for the question Ethan. Uh, it's a very good question and it comes back to that kind of political desire to put resources to put the money where their mouth is so uh, so we'll be hoping for, for for some resources to support initiatives like many good men uh, and to support youth workers on the ground I think that was a really good question thank you for that I think this any initiative even when the resources are in place, has to be driven by young people. You know, I'm 44 now, now, and I know I know nothing about being a young person anymore. What I have got is a platform, you know, so, so a lot of the work that I do is participatory with young people, so it's got to be driven, but we have to listen. You know, we can have the infrastructure in place and the resources and things like this included in relationships and sex education, for example, but it ha young people have to be the drivers, but we've got to let them on board. Um, and quite often that's not, that doesn't happen. You know, young people aren't listened to. It's like we know best, so we will tell you what you need to know. I haven't got a clue, but I know how to drive a project. You know, so it's, it's a real collaborative process with young people. Um, and that, that's a mindset that I think is shifting. I think, yeah, I think, I think we I mean, are listening. I guess it's more, more expensive left. though, yeah. isn't it? It's yeah. more expensive to include young people. I worked with two groups of young people for seven months and it wasn't enough. But it was, you know, enough to get this bit of the project done, um, and it costs a lot of money. And in order to roll it out across Scotland, will cost a lot of money. And it is participatory, and there's all sorts of ways that it can become more or less participatory. But the less participatory it is, the cheaper it is. Mm. And as now the UNCRC, we have the right to participate as children and young people. Mm -hmm. So it's all about kind of embedding some of that process. So we had, we had a... Can a, I just pick up on one more point that you made? We've got to be really careful about teaching about incel as well and the way that we do it. And we need advice from young people how to frame it properly because the last thing you want to do if someone... You know what I'm going to say, don't you? Is, yeah, <laughs> it's, you don't want them to go and start looking it all up because then the algorithm kicks in so there is, there's a real the, the, I don't know what the balance is but it's working with young people to find that balance because you don't want them to go and look at it if they don't know about it either yeah, safeguarding yeah. yeah is it a mixture of what we were talking about engaging when we were t addressing your point it's that kind of those ways of kind mm. of engaging uh, rather than showing and telling mm. it's about engaging and asking isn't mm. it and so. I don't think it's about teaching about incel I think it's mm. about teaching about the the roots that people go on prior to coming involved in incel cultures. I think that's the bit as well. And to add to that point, it's got to be legislation. So sex education, you know, it has to be really strongly placed in legislation. And although there is bits to that, it's still so inconsistent. Um, I work for a third sector organisation and a charity, and I know what we can do with resource, you know, and we all go on about resource, but actually, I think there's a lot of opportunity for third sector agencies to combine forces as well um, and I think there is something in that but we have to have investment from this building almost in terms of what that means to allow people to take pieces of work forward in that way. Definitely. We've time for one more question. There was one on, on this side, I think it was. Yes, sir. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you for everything you've spoken about so far, and thanks for all brilliant questions and points from the, the crew. Um, I just want to take note of where we are. So I'm raising daughters in Scotland for a very specific reason, and that's because of the positive children's rights landscape. Last you know, July, we had the, the Convention Children's Rights Become Law in Scotland. We also have parliamentarians here calling for the prescribed uh, for organisations mostly largely operating in England right now but across the country across the UK around uh, like the English Defence League to be called as prescribed organisations under the Terrorism Act um, what's one thing one thing I haven't heard you speak about much in the panel is incel culture is related to incel movement which is movement that that promotes uh, terrorist violence as a tactic and we've seen that in different parts of the UK it promotes that and where young people who have been able to get access, or young men, been able to get access to weaponry to commit terrorist violence. It's been very, like, a, at least you'll count one, one hand, the number of incidents where that's happened in the last five years, but it happens. Uh, I'd also know that this parliament has failed to, to use anti-terrorism money to fund the kind of education and intervention you were describing, and yet the two are totally connected. So what's one thing any of the panellists might advise the Scottish Parliament this time to push one piece of policy around how anti-terrorism is worked in Scotland alongside the education kind of interventions you're talking about? I'm so glad you asked that. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We've had this conversation a lot this morning, actually. I think there's two bits to that, first of all, is I think we have to be mindful in terms of the word terror and the word terrorism in relation to incel. Because I think there is bits in one of the cases that I can think of in terms of that that was defined in, in an act of mass violence. You know, I would argue it wasn't an act of terrorism, it was an act of mass violence in terms of where it had three or more victims. And I think it didn't have a terror radicalisation agenda attached to it. Actually, that individual was a promoter rather than actually someone themselves that came through kind of radicalisation places. And again, that would be a very, very small, as you mentioned, proportion, even in the States, where we know a vast majority of cases of kind of school mass shootings, for example, being related to and cell manifest. But I think you're right, and it's that balance in terms of the prevent agenda, which I think it is helpful to see and so being included in that but what we have to be mindful of is when we're talking about children and young people i would argue at the minute the prevent agenda does not match the child protection processes in scotland so what we have to be really clear about is when we're talking about children and young people that the child protection system is established and set up and i think the work personally has got to be done more within children and young people within committees within parliament feeding into prevent opposed to it just coming straight from a terror approach that answer your question yeah, good that's fine we don't have time for any more questions so i would just like to ask the panelists to sum up in a minute yeah. uh, if you could sum up some of our discussion today sophie um i think we need to reframe how as a society we treat young men and boys to prevent the misogyny the violence the patriarchy that we see and those conversations are difficult to have we need to also look at vulnerabilities and support we can give for vulnerabilities, but we need the resources. Thanks, Sophie. David? Yeah. You want to go ditto? Um, no, I think, <laughs> I, think, I think there's a number of things, but yeah, I totally agree. I think what we need to do is keep the conversation open, and I think what this topic always does is it generates debate. Often it generates different conversations. That's really healthy. I'd be worried if it didn't generate a bit of debate. I think what we have to do is be well and as in professional networks and in society, we may all have different views, but we can still feed to this agenda. I think it's a societal responsibility to change this um, alongside, as we mentioned, government. Um, so, yeah, and just to say a thank you for everybody for feeding in and coming along. Thanks, David. Claire? Um, yeah, I was so interested in what you were saying. I forgot what I wanted to say. Love. <laughs> Love, yes. <laughs> Love and... Um, I, th I think I think where I'm most at at the moment is thinking about what is you know how can grown up men be in this conversation, and it's not about young people only. You know, it's about changing our attitudes towards how we think about gender across the board, maybe, and it's about. Um, I, I don't know. I'm still hearing this word terror, and I suppose I kind of want to say that there there is terror in this for young women and women, grown-up women, old women, walking down the street at night during the day,
across the meadows, whatever, like getting into a lift on your own and suddenly a man jumps in that lift with you. Like there is terror in this and we don't call it out as terror enough. And when we see women being killed, we don't think about it in the framework of that was a man killing a woman. We think about in the framework of that was a husband who had mental health issues and was about to lose his job and he killed his wife and daughter. You know, but no, he was a man supported by a masculinist society and that causes terror for women. So, yeah. Um, so moving on from that. that was Thank you very much. Gender equality clearly benefits everyone, including men, um, is the message that's come out loud and clear today. Um, so thank you very much. We must end there. I'm really sorry about that because we could probably talk about this all <coughs> afternoon. It's Friday. We could probably take it into the pub, the traditional <laughs> hegemonic masculine pub in Scotland, which we won't do. Um, I'd like to thank our panel. So David, Claire, Sophie, you've been great. Um, I hope we can have this discussion again or a follow-up discussion. Can I remind everyone here to fill in their survey? You'll receive automatically if you booked via Eventbrite. We have a few paper copies floating around somewhere, I think, with our assistant. Uh, and we'd very much appreciate your thoughts on how to improve the Festival of Politics. Uh, may I also take this opportunity to remind you that today's the last of five days of discussion of the festival. Uh, we've got two more debates today, two more events today. I should say one at 3.15 on the importance of responsible debate, which I think we'd all be very good at, actually, um, having debated responsibly. And at four o'clock, we've got an event in the debating chamber and we're discussing the past, past 25 years of the Scottish Parliament. It's been that long. And we're looking at the next 25 years. So you could share your thoughts on how to do Scottish Parliament better as well. Um, if, if you've not joined us today and you're online, we hope to see you at next year's Festival of Politics in person. But could I just ask you to join with me in showing our appreciation to our fabulous panel <laughs> and our fabulous audience. <laughs>